You're probably feeling a little more Lutheran than Congregationalist at this point. Amen. <laughs> yeah, because Don's saying that because he was born on Reformation Day in a Lutheran hospital, so. <laughs> Anglican Bishop Mark Dyer contends that the only way to understand Christianity in the 21st century is to recognize that about every 500 years, the church, capital C, the church feels compelled to hold a giant rummage sale. <laughs> what we keep and what we have use for no longer. That metaphorical rummage sale is in full swing now as it was 500 years ago as well. We mark the Reformation, the Great Reformation, on October 31st, 1517, when Luther hammered his 95 theses to a church door in Wittenberg. And we know that every significant historical event happens not in a vacuum, but is fired in the crucible of its time. The Reformation actually happened over decades, and its powerful and sustaining influence over our Protestant worship and our world cannot be underestimated. But how on earth is it possible to talk about its profound shaping of our experience of Christianity today in a brief and hopefully meaningful 15-minute sermon? Well, since this is the Twitter age, I will sum up the theological and religious shifts in a tweet. Luther's tweet, broadcast across Europe at the time, would have gone something like this. Hashtag solo scriptura, solo gracia, solo fide, indulgences, all caps, fake religion. <laughs> Printing press will show I have proof, exclamation, exclamation, exclamation. That tweet and the scriptures read in German today represent the major themes of the Reformation. And they illustrate the most significant and sustaining shifts in theological thinking. And they are the foundation on which Protestantism would be built. Are you with me so far? So sola scriptura, only scripture, scripture only. The word, the written word, the word of God took center place not the Eucharist any longer. It was the reading of our sacred text that the Christ spirit was found in addition to the Eucharist, but the word took center place. Now the deeper question in all of this was the question, where is the authority? Where is the authority? Authority was in the word of God, not in the pope or in the priests. The word, its study, its interpretation, and its proclamation now became the heart of the Protestant movement. And thanks to the invention of the Gutenberg printing press, those scriptures would be accessible to the masses. And sola scriptura, the primacy of the word, was dependent on the primacy of literacy of the masses. So you can begin to see what a significant shift this is beginning to have across Europe. So that was the first one, solo scriptura, the word. The second one, solo gracia, solo fide, only by grace, only by faith. Luther came to believe you are saved by grace, by faith, and not by works. In fact, Luther was tortured, he was a rather tortured soul in many ways, tortured by his own sins and a harsh critic of other sins and immorality. He spent much of his early life as a monk trying to earn his salvation and knew that he fell horribly, even damnably short. His revelation through the reading of the word was that you can only be saved by faith and faith was a gift from God. He was justified in the eyes of God, not by anything he did, but by everything God did. He began to preach that you are saved without merit and without money. 
and he railed against the indulgences at that time that were being sold by the church and the local priests. The rich could buy their salvation, the poor could not. He was passionate about the centrality of grace and faith. You could not earn, buy, or bargain for your salvation. I think the deeper question in that is, who is worthy, or even deeper, what does it mean to be human? The third major shift is the priesthood of all believers, and you see that in the Peter reading this morning. Because at that time, there were two classes of Christians. The first class were the priests and the monks and the religious hierarchy. The second class, of course, were the rest of the laity. The second class was inferior, and the first class had access to God and were mediators of that God for everybody else. And Luther leveled the playing field. Everything was focused on one's individual relationship, non-mediated relationship with God and with the Word. Things became democratic. And here we are as Congregationalists today. The deeper question in that is, not only where is the authority, but who is the authority, and who is the arbitrator of right? The Reformation changed the church, was the birth of Protestantism. Protestantism is a, is a wide path, as we know, and it renewed the Catholic Church of that day. It was the cause and effect of sweeping changes in Europe and subsequently had tremendous influence on America. Now, when we look back at anything in history, it's hard for us to comprehend the major shift that happened because the world as we know it today is so dramatically different. But this kind of toppling of authority in the Reformation gave rise to modernity and subsequently the spread of liberalism, secularism, democracy, and even capitalism. I just didn't make this up myself. I mean, there are plenty of people that, that believe this. Now, Matthew Fox, he's a scholar, and he was a Catholic priest, but got excommunicated from the Catholic Church because of his beliefs. He's the founder of Creation Spirituality, an institute in Oakland. He's now an Episcopal priest. He wrote a book called A New Reformation, and he says... Like any great historical event, the Reformation was the product of many combined forces. And among the most significant were the following. So listen to this. The invention of the printing press. The technological, technological achievement effectively democratized knowledge and the power that comes from knowledge and information. He says it this way. The, religious, the Reformation was the religious response to the invention of the printing press. After all, the first book printed was, exactly, pamphlets were the social media of the day. They printed so many pamphlets to get out the message of the Reformation. The second combined force was the rise of nation states. Europe's nation states eagerly accepted Martin Luther's break with the Holy Roman Empire and the Roman Church, which had legitimized that empire and kept it together. The third force was the corruption of the Roman Catholic Church in the highest places. Leading up to the Reformation, there was defective theology, the selling of indulgences, nepotism, and so on. Greed and the popes and their fiefdoms. And the last thing he says is the rise of an educated elite. Martin Luther owed much to the humanist scholarship of his day and was among those who could read and translate biblical languages. Along with Matthew Fox, many scholars and spiritual leaders, and I'm sure you have already recognized the parallels to today. So think with me just for a moment. A force, the technolo technological revolution. Now, the acceleration at which changes are happening in our society is unprecedented. I mean, think about it for a minute. The Gutenberg printing press was invented in 1440, okay? The Reformation was in 1517. So that's 
about 75 years later. This kind of tech revolution that we're in, it was just 13 years ago that Facebook was created. 11 years ago that Twitter, unfortunately, was created. <laughs> and just 10 years ago that the smartphone was produced. And the world is completely different, is it not? The world is completely different. Yesterday we were at a small church at a memorial down in Pismo Beach and my daughter was helping out in the kitchen and there was a rotary phone still on the wall. <laughs> so I walked in and apparently a rotary phone that still works. So she had picked up the rotary phone. She said, I tried to call you on yourself from the rotary phone. And I said, well, what happened? She said, you can't make this call, it's long distance. She said, what does that mean? Right. <laughs> now think about our economy, a gig economy, right? Think about Uber, the largest taxi service in the world and doesn't even own a, own a car. In 2020, they predict there, that there will be the majority of self-driving cars on the road. There's going to be an app on your phone that can diagnose pretty much any health condition you have. In fact, 3D printers just built a six-story building in China. The technological revolution. Do you know that the first solid ink printer was released just in 1988? The tech revolution. The second, the rise of globalism. Right? The earth is flat in a way that we have never experienced it before. The third is disillusionment with religious institutions. The hypocrisy of the church. The sex scandals of the church. And then the rise of fundamentalisms in many religions, our own included, that are in bed with political power in ways that are all about power and very little about values. And new knowledge about our universe, our bodies, and about all kinds of things. So really, 500 years later, we're asking the same questions. Who gets to say what's right? Where's the authority? What do you look to for authority? And even as Protestants, we question sola scriptura anymore, don't we? I think it's sola interneta, personally, but <laughs> the democratization of knowledge is something that is more profound than we've ever seen before. We've seen that sola scriptura, the primacy of the word, has its own absolutisms and problems. So there is, I believe, a new reformation going on it's largely undefined because it's unfolding. But I believe that this new reformation, whatever its particular details will look like, will be a return to some basics. A return in an age of increasing complexity, a return to simple and profound truths. I believe the spiritual revolution that we need is a return to our bodies in an age where we locate ourselves outside of ourselves most of the time, a return to the sacredness of the body, a return to face-to-face -face communication and community, where we enjoy simple things like a shared meal. A community and local work is at the heart of what we do, that the church becomes a place where we figuratively and literally unplug so that we can be present in a way to one another and to our own selves in ways that we might not be in our everyday life. After all, the tenet of our faith, our Christian faith, is the incarnation. God becomes flesh. and It's that way that we need to show up to one another, body to body. You know, Matthew Fox went to Wittenberg a few years ago and posted his own 95 theses on the door of Wittenberg. What would your beliefs about faith and God be?
In the rummage sale, though I love tradition, what do we need to let go of? Personally, I'm ready to let go of anything that doesn't serve the highest good and call us to love. So if I were to tweet out a reformation today, mine might look something like hashtag everything is connected and what we do matters. Hashtag not I, me, and mine, but we, us, and ours. Hashtag love matters. Hashtag we are the earth and the earth is us. And hashtag justice is what love looks like in public. So happy Reformation then and now. Amen.